My first question is, is always, especially to, to, to the military types like yourself, is, you know, to, to our listeners who, who aren't aware of, of your background, can you just tell us how your journey in the military started and then also how it evolved and you became involved in such a, yeah, such a digital sort of innovative project, such as the, the digitization of the military? Yeah, so uh, to have ended up in such a place, I come from a very stereotypical sort of military background. You know, my my dad, my uncles, my brothers, um, all infantrymen, all, you know, uh, so from a very military background, uh, Irish family originally, but but we've always, you know, we've done done a lot of this over over a while. And um, I, you know, I joined the Royal Green Jackets, now the Rifles, so a very mainstream part of the army, I guess. And I had a very sort of typical mainstream career right up until, you know, I, I, I was second in command of a battle group in in Iraq, you know, having gone through all the sort of Northern Ireland Balkans sort of piece in, yeah. in the early part of my career um, to Iraq, very tough tour in Iraq um, in 07, and then to command a, an infantry battle group or a, a, a combat battle group in Helmand in, in Afghanistan in uh, the early part of the, uh, you know, so, so 12, uh, 2012, that sort of time. Um, but I guess through all that, um, to answer your question, you know, fighting is all about people, technology, and yeah. information, you know, and, and from the bow and arrow, I missed that bit, but through to, you know, muskets and rifles and yeah. the rest of it, you know, the technology is a, a really big part of it. The people are the constant bit, but but the, the thing that connects the technology and the people is, guess what? Is, is information yeah. and uh so so although i say it's a very sort of conventional background you, you're always dabbling in information and i guess you know the, the whole story is 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 through iraq and afghanistan thinking more and more about how we fight for information with information um and and that led me ultimately to to uh, to hear so you know happy to expand on that as much as you want but um I, I formed the, the, the Army's Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Brigade. So as a brigade commander, that's, what's that, 5,000 odd people, um, 19 different units, um, Royal Artillerymen who fly drones or Intelligence uh, Corps folk who, who analyze intelligence or um, Royal Signals folk who, who um, uh, fight in the electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah. Um, so a whole range of, you know, very broad canvas of people, but all information centric. So integrating them technically and in human terms across silos, cat badges, whatever. Yeah, uh, I did, and then on. Anyway, I could go on forever, but <laughs> but that was the sort of journey from from being a, a, a straight infantryman, if you like, into yeah. into my uh, my my dabbling with information and and, and yeah. now digital. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. I think um, in the, in the last few years. In the commercial world, I know data has become, you know, a big buzzword and how people use data and information. And I've I've always thought the military would would lead on that sort of thing because it's, you know, you can maybe lose lose some customers if you get some information wrong in in the commercial space. But if you you know if you if you if you see it all the time, it's horrible incidents targeting your own soldiers. It's it's absolutely vital. So you know, I think it's I think the military is sort of you know, really leading the way there. What 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 got you involved in in this particular program? I know you you've spoken about working with. With, with Charles Forte, but what what was it particularly about this that you thought you know what I can really I can really add some value and this really interests me? Yeah, so uh, so I'd, I'd done some work for the army in in effectively my last job. Um, I, I led something called the Information Maneuver Project, which um, was kicked off by the army's board, and then I commanded the division in the army. Um, it's now called Six UK Division that holds all of our information centric capabilities, not just intelligence, but our communicators, our signalers, and so on. So I'd done a lot of thinking about um, well, what the Russians call both information technical, as in digital and data, and information psychological. So how you use information either to outwit your enemies or to confuse your enemies or, or disrupt your enemies. So I'd done a lot of thinking about that and written a lot about that. And, and then I was pitched, really. I was going off to another job in Army headquarters to be the director of capability, which is sort of, you know, building all of our capabilities very um not just hardware focused but very you know traditional you know tanks and armored yeah. personnel carriers and so on the whole shebang and then i was i was pitched to to to, to interview for this job for charlie and uh, it was really charlie who 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 attracted me to the job i'd never worked for a civilian before uh, worked alongside lots of civil servants sure. but charlie has a sort of 40-year career as a 
as an industry um, digital dude, uh, largely in BP. And apart from the the sense that, you know, you know, it's a passion of mine helping, you know, defense and, and the, you know, the army, but, but defense um, now uh, fight better with information. It was just, I thought I could learn a lot of Charlie just by yeah. being exposed to a very different culture and so on. So that's, it's not a very neat story, to be honest. It all <laughs> happened very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, the job I was going to, you know, I was commanding 30,000 people in a division. I was going to this sort of board level job in the army with oodles of brilliant people working for me and you know a chief of staff and a military assistant and a pa and a outer office team or whatever yeah, and charlie yeah. said hey come work for me and i said oh that's great what's what's <laughs> there and he's, he said nothing not <laughs> no nothing nothing at all <laughs> so everybody thought i was mad actually why why would you go and do that uh, yeah. and you know the place i was going to work is 15 minutes from my house whereas charlie was sort of either in london or caution so an hour yeah. away each way and everybody thought I was mad, and and I think they still do. But it's it's been great fun, and uh, and you know we've got a great team, and I think we're we're starting to 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 have an impact, and um, yeah, I love it. No, that's great. Um, we're certainly start, starting to see it, and I guess the the, the natural sort of follow on question for that is is what you know, what what does digitization mean? What does it mean to you? What what's the where where are you trying to get things in? I guess more more specifically, how does that help the guys who who are in you know in in, in the combat zone? Sure. So I I mean that's my passion. You know, um, yeah. is helping out these on front line. I mean, a lot of the work I do at the moment is is strategic digitization. So it's about making data accessible and then exploiting it. But but and and I thought I was going to do more of the exploitation, more of the stuff. But but you know we are where we are in defence, and yeah. uh, we can come back to that. But but I, I spend most of my time on the the strategy and the big lumps. But to your point about how it helps the soldier on the ground or the sailor in a on a ship or a, a pilot in a plane, um, I mean I would I would just say digitization to me when you cut away all the other language, for us in the military that's about enriching people's working lives with information in the same way as their personal lives have been transformed. So yeah. what do I mean by that? I mean, let's start in barracks, you know, the, the less sexy bit. But, you know, if you look at how we bank now, I mean, I was saying to a mate of mine the other day, can you even remember going to a bank to cash a check? Well, mm -hmm. People like me used to do that, you know, and, yeah. and bank cards came in when I was at university. And, and now even a bank card, you know, now in lockdown, when I'm, you know, if I need cash for something very rarely, even going to get, money out of machines seems quite old fashioned. Yeah. Um, so point. look how far we've come there. But soldiers, you know, in, in interaction with our HR systems, often you're going back in time, not, yeah. not forward into how we bank and, and conduct all other business. A lot of the great online gov.uk work, you know, how you file your tax return or whatever, you know, yeah. that's all moved forward. But, but for a lot of us in defense and wider government, and I think industry too, a lot of us come out of our personal lives into our working lives and we actually go back in time because we haven't kept pace with that. So to me, digitization is that. So what does that mean in the, in the battle space, in, on, on the front line, um, if you like? Well, some of it's very easy to understand. I mean, look at, look at, how, we, look at how we drive around the country using Google Maps or, or, yeah, or yeah. You know, whatever your preferred, preferred platform is. Well, navigation is an instrument. Navigation is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, it's a big deal because nobody wants to do five extra miles when they could have cut the corner. It's yeah. a big deal because because you don't want to run into the enemy position and get killed. And it's a big deal because going through a river makes you cold and wet. and You don't want to do that if there's a if there's a bridge you could safely cross. Yeah. So, you know, just the way that, that navigation in our personal lives has been transformed. We, we want to do that in, in the battle space. I mean, that that will sound trite, but it's a big deal. Um, a lot of our soldiers spend their time gaming. You know, like like any 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 uh, younger folk these days, and if you look at the way they ingest information in those very dynamic um, games, well, they want to have that in their working life. Now, that could be the gunner in a Challenger Two tank, yeah. you know, who is remember he's getting all sorts of feeds of information. He's trying to find the enemy and and let's face it, in that case, kill the enemy. His commander's talking to him on one radio. The driver is talking on the intercom. Uh, somebody's probably just handed him a brew because that always happens uh, in contact too. And he's probably got hot tea now in his lap. And the more we can wrap that uh, gunner with really intuitive information feeds, the yeah. better chance he has of, 
of winning that engagement and his his mates uh, and him, you know, going home to tea and medals, not not being the one who loses that engagement. So, uh, I mean, that's that's the sort of obvious bit. Uh, beyond yeah. that, I mean, I God, I, I could literally go on all day. But you know, just some of the some of the stuff we do in our connectivity at home, you know, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC. We got a lot of cables still in in yeah. in in, and, and every one of those cables is something to trip up on. It's more expense. It's something else to snag. Um, uh, you know, all of that. You know that we we recognise in our private lives. We need to bring that into our working lives yeah. to to make people's lives enriched. And you know, I won't even get on to training and synthetics. And um, I mean, one of somebody was asking me the other day about virtual working or you know, working from home. And is that really different? And I said, funnily enough, it's not. I mean, every yeah. operation I've been on, we spend our times getting away from each other. People will be surprised about this, but a lot about being an instrument is spacing, as we'd call it, because yeah. you don't want to be hit by the same bullet. You don't want to be killed by the same artillery shell. So we spend a lot of our times getting away from each other and then coming together. Well, when you come together for an orders group, for instance, or even a section commander getting his section around him, eight blokes, eight, eight, eight soldiers to give them orders, that yeah. is a moment of huge vulnerability. Because at that stage you can all be killed in a by a by a single event, and if you look at how we're doing this business now, using the virtual world much more intelligently, we can do our business, we can scale up our tempo, and we can keep people safer. So uh, sorry for going on. I mean, I, I literally could do it all day, but yeah. but the the possibilities of digitization for the frontline. You know, I've talked about soldiers here, but for sailors and airmen. And indeed, civil servants, you know, whether they're working Whitehall or in Glasgow or wherever else, uh, are endless. But it's about enriching their lives with that information in the same way as their personal lives have been. No, amazing. I, you, know, you, you try to get away from talking about synthetics and simulations and everything, but I, I, I'd love to talk about that. I know from my, my day job in recruitment, there's a, there's a huge amount of focus at the moment on synthetic environments, training simulators. Do you, do you, where, where do you think we are currently as opposed to where we We'd like to be and do, do you think that that will you know will have a almost entirely artificial training experience one day how, how do you see that playing out so i mean so i don't think we'll ever want to get to entirely artificial i mean warfare you know i think for for, for all of my future career which isn't that long but all of your future life you know it's gonna still be an intensely human experience and wherever ai gets to on the battle space humans are going to be part of that so yeah. The physical training bit, the, the enduring cold and wet and misery is, uh, but doing that as a team is always going to be part of our training. However, we can hugely enhance our training by synthetics. And, you know, if you fly a fast jet these days, you know, we're, we're doing that pretty well. You know, you've got brilliant synthetics there to help you with that. But we don't have a whole system of systems to be able to fire the fast jet and the tank and everything together. We've come a long way, but there's still a long way to go. And of course, some of the work I'm uh, working on with the rest of Defense Digital and the, the wider digital function, um, and very much related to Strategic Command's initiative on multi-domain integration, is bringing those, you know, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the, the land domain, the maritime domain, the air domain, and cyber and space together um, so that information, so that data can be accessed across those bits. Once you do that, once you provide that digital backbone that connects sensors and shooters and decision makers, then you can really power into your synthetics yeah. and you can train for not just war, but you can train for what we're in at the moment, this period of intense state-on-state -state competition. You can train for that much better. And as you move from a, a, a point of training to conducting operations, you can move from training into, into what we would call you know, mission rehearsals. So you can run either with physical people, with personas in the synthetic world, or with um, virtual personas. You can war game and rehearse that operation. Not so that you know the answer, the perfect answer, because the enemy always gets a vote, yeah. but so that you can see the impact of different courses of action. And you can start doing your, what we would call your what ifs. What if the enemy goes left flanking. What would we want to do? What if we lose that ammunition dump in you know, day 22 of the war? How do we get our resupply there? What if the enemy takes out this communications node? How would we rebuild the network? So your, your ability to train and then simulate and do mission rehearsal 
and inform your decision making in that synthetic world is just incredibly powerful. But it but it ain't easy. You know, that's going to be a that's a that's a big undertaking. Um, yeah. But it's yeah. Dead yeah. On. No, no, no. I bet I am um, not sure if you saw. I, I, I was speaking to, to to Commander Briscoe not not long ago when we were speaking mm. about um, that that digital backbone and, and how important it is, and in, in, in that context of you know getting information on ships which are li literally hundreds of miles apart, um, and some of the the, the the technological innovations and uh, that have gone gone forward to help that. And I know we we've spoken previously about um, you know, the, the MOD cloud and and how that software is like helping you guys become like more more agile i guess i think how do you how do you see the future looking do you do you foresee if you know top secret information going to the cloud did you will will siloing of information cease to exist because it will all be cloud focused how, how do you see it working so um all of the above and but i just can't tell you exactly how we're going to get yeah, there so um you know would it be great if we could collapse everything and just do data centric security yeah. so that you know, we could live it all in one environment and you could get access to that beta data if you had above secret clearance. And if you didn't, then the data is secure, but you can't get access to it. Yeah. Maybe one day. But, but, our, but you know, we've been, you know, our journey to cloud, as people would say, has been slower than some, faster yeah. than others. And, and you know, we're, we're getting there, um, both at what we would call official, official sensitive level, so our, our normal base working level, yeah. secret, which is the level at which we fight, and above secret, which which has always been a very heavy intelligence based um, area, but probably has more utility. Um, and you know, right now our efforts are making sure that we have cross domain solutions in place so that you can access. You know, if you're living at secret, that you can access information from the the, the level down. Um, uh, but you you can browse down or or, or take information up, yeah. uh, and that could be as simple. I mean, th this will sound banal, but that could be as simple as accessing your official calendar because you're working at secret, but you don't want to change systems to, to work out what your next meeting is. I mean, that'll yeah. sound banal, but people waste their time doing that. Yeah. Or of course, it's it's more about, you know, accessing publicly available information, well, you know, open source information um, at that secret layer to compare your your sort of classified sources with, with whatever else is reading on, on websites every day. Yeah. Um, so... That's exactly what we're going after um, with our journey to cloud. It's it, it's complicated. To your specific question, will we put above secret information in public cloud? I'm I'm thinking not. Um, yeah. Even the most dedicated dedicated of public clouds, I I, I don't know. But um, we're we're you know we're certainly going to use cloud compute that elastic capability and the sort of services at uh, at their level over over time. But exactly when and how and we do it, yeah. you know. Um, you're gonna to have to speak to somebody a lot cleverer than me, but yeah, but sure. but we're 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 heavily on that journey to cloud, and yeah. you know there are a lot of people who have have done it before to help us with that. Um, we're we're pretty much there at Mod Cloud. You know, the, uh, I think you spoke to Sarah Sharkey in the in the past about you know what we're doing there. Um, but you know, a long way to go there. But but we're sort of started. Um, but but the higher classifications will will take a bit more time. But we're not far off. Yeah, it's it's, it's so interesting. I think you know from a almost from like a sci-fi point of view. I remember as a boy watching James Bond and it seemed so easy just pop onto his laptop and find out all the information. And it's, you know, I'm sure it will, there's, there's some security concerns. Is that Jason, is that Jason Bourne guy? I want to know. Yeah, He's, yeah. He can know. read people's minds and he can just listen to any phone call. It's very, very useful. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's interesting the fact that you were even going on that journey to becoming, you know, more agile because I think one of the things I was uh, hoping to ask you a bit later, but Ooh, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. I lost you at um, after Jason Bourne. <laughs> Somebody, I mean, miraculously, Jason Bourne got into the system. Yeah, he, he does that. He's a, he's I lost a you then. He is. Um, sorry, I was I was saying that um, uh, with with like like, like te technological uh, technological advances we're having, I think one thing that um, that maybe James actually told me about a book uh, that you know the Team of Teams book and how. Uh, Particularly our military, but but a lot of militaries are, are renowned for being um, all of the buzzwords that you hear in the commercial sector now, like agile and you know independent yep. teams. I think 
previously, uh, uh, you know, government departments or even the military defense departments have acted probably slightly differently um, on home soil than they would on, on in, in the battlefield. Like, what do you think are some of the things that the you know the, that we can learn from you know that combat space, bring that back, and make make everything more you know, more, more agile? I guess. Yeah. So, uh, in the battle space, certainly. Again, speaking as a soldier, because that's my yeah. background. But I'll I'll bet you find exactly the same on a ship or in a in a squadron or a wing in the air force. You know, uh, when you're on operations, you you're collaborative. You don't really care who's the infantryman, who's the artilleryman, who's the intelligence corps, who's the signaller. You're yeah. all in there together, and you're all helping each other. Um, you don't, you know, there's no monopoly on genius that comes with rank, you know, because I wear something on my front chest. If somebody's got a good idea, you want to get that good idea into action as soon yeah. as possible. So all of that, you know, feels very much like sort of stripy teams, multidisciplinary teams, very agile. Um, even some of the, and I, you know, I've spoken about this separately, even some of the, so my digital teams are always saying, you know, Tom, fall in love with the problem. You know, don't just slap the solution on it. And, yeah. and we do that. You know, we send out a recce party. We do, you know, what you would call business analysis. Yeah. But, you know, we do intelligence preparation of the battlefield. We really try and understand the problem. But you know that you're never going to understand it perfectly. So you get a, a thesis together, you get a plan together, and you start executing. But you execute it knowing, as we would say, that no plan survives first contact. Yeah. So it's not the plan. It's the planning. It's that ability, like we were just talking about, about synthetics. It's that ability to look at what, you know, how the plan's going to change, how, yeah. what iterations you're going to have to take. So that's how we fight. Um, now, why does that not work so well when you come back, um, come back home, uh, if you like, into barracks? Well, I guess we're a, we're a big organization. And every big organization suffers from, from, from that. Um, and also we're what I call a grade one listed organization. You know, we've built our DNA, our culture over hundreds of years on things that gave us strategic advantage yeah. at, at one stage. So, you know, we don't have a hierarchy for the fun of it. We have a hierarchy because in the industrial age, that was the most efficient way to run an organization. Um, we don't have funny ranks and titles and, and even put them on our shirts, you know, for the fun of it. We do that because, you know, that's been really important as part of that DNA. Now, as you go flatter and more agile, some of those things need to change. And, and our, our organizational journey there, there's no point just saying, right, get rid of all your traditions. That, that doesn't work. And, and we're not even free to do it. You know, people around the nation really care what UK defense looks like yeah they really care about the external artifacts those sacraments the sort of external expression of an inner, inner faith if you like they really care about it so we can't just say stop doing that because other people have a stake so you have to celebrate them but then you have to look at what will give us strategic advantage in the in the 21st century and how do we how do we you know what i've called in the past hack our culture how do we how do we tap yeah. into that dna tap into that sense of collectiveness, collaboration, mission focus. Um, you know, our leadership philosophy is mission command. How do we focus people on the mission rather than on the inputs or, you know, how do you, how do you focus on what you want, what the outcomes are rather than how you're going to do it? So how do you unleash your talent to find new ways to do stuff, which is all, I mean, that's just agile. That's just how yeah. any digital team is a good digital team is working. So my sense is it, it's all there. We just need to tap into it. And with a few changes, we could get there really quite rapidly. Um, and, you know, like the rest of the world, um, a combination of digital disruption, um, a bunch of the other disruptions going on, whether it's climate change or, 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 or COVID yeah. um, is accelerating that. And, you know, just look at the behavioral changes across defense you know, and the rest of the nation, as we've gone through, you know, COVID lockdowns and, and responded. And, you know, it really shows you how fast we can move in defense when we're, when we've got a proper mission focus, uh, and a bit of threat, you know, that, that, that helps focus people's minds. And we can move really fast. So I'm, you know, I rage against this a bit. But I'm net net, I'm very optimistic that, that we can, we can do it. It's in our DNA. And we just need to, yeah. to find a route back to that. Yeah, no, I just said, I, 
I, I've always, and, and everyone I've ever spoken to from the military um, has said the same thing. And I think one thing that I find so interesting is that there are such clearly defined ranks in the military. But as you say, in 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 a combat situation, it's just who's who's the smartest guy in this situation, and you know, and how do we, do, you know, and that person comes to the fore, and you know, probably not necessarily as true in the commercial world. Do you think? Do you think that is from the training of the military? Do you think that's is 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 that threat that if we don't come together, then you know, something bad's going to happen? Do you think it's a combination of the two? Yeah. I mean, definitely dr being driven by that sort of survival instinct. You know, we're, yeah. we're social animals and we, you know, if you fight alone, you're not going to fight for very long. Um, yeah. There's that lovely, they say it's an African proverb, I don't know, but, you know, if you want to go somewhere fast, go alone. But if you want to go a long way, go to go together. And that, yeah, yeah. I think that's just a lovely, lovely phrase. I mean, we're lucky, aren't we, in, in some ways, because we've got this incredibly strong identity. You know, whether yeah. it's the British Army or the Royal Navy or the Royal Air Force or UK Defence, you know, we've got this really strong identity which can bind people together. Um, and what we need to do is use that strong identity, but also then unleash people to be their authentic selves. So it's why yeah. our current sort of, you know, uh, focus on diversity and inclusion, just like everybody else. But it's it's a really fascinating thing because actually we've got the tools to to have that central identity that binds everybody together. But actually within that, to be able to say, hey, we share this. We're all wearing the same green pajamas, as I call them. <laughs> so you can be yourselves. You know, there's, there's no problem with that. So actually, we've got a really good foundation to be as diverse and inclusive as anybody could be because we share that central identity. But you've got to see it as a way of, of giving you the opportunity to be different, not saying everybody's got to be the same cookie cutter um, approach. I hope that makes sense. It's a, yeah, it's, no, a, but it, 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 it's an interesting... Um, conundrum and opportunity yeah no 100 it's, it's 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 the talking point of the town is how do you get people to work together better how do you get you know the get get egos out of the way and get the smartest person for that particular problem and i mean two different problems could have two different sets of skills and, and all that so no i, I find yeah. it really interesting i am um, we, we've touched on this a little bit but i'd love to go you know a little bit deeper on i guess some of the um like specific challenges that you found coming from such a uh, again, again, to, to I think in a I think it was when you were speaking with maybe James. I think you were a self-described knuckle dragon infantryman. I made me laugh. I um, is there anything specific that you found going from from that environment into a you know a very you know techy um, digital environment that's been as much about you know the the tools you've got as, as the menu lead? Have you found anything that's particularly challenged you or or you know sort of you oh know, look, I mean we would be here all day. I mean I. <laughs> talk about every day of school day i mean i spend every day of my life learning new words new ideas uh new tech yeah but, you know i'm i'm fascinated by the exploitation of the tech not the yeah. tech itself but you've got to understand enough so yeah i mean we really would be here all day um i and i think you know actually now whenever i meet anybody who, who tells me they're an expert in something, I sort of, if, if it's in digital, then I sort of, I question how can they be an expert because the world is moving so far. So, I mean, I've got yeah. some super smart people working for me, but the most super smart amongst them are the ones that are most thirsty for knowledge. Sure. And they're so, you know, there's that, you know, on your learning edge, you know, the, the smartest of them are the most, um, uh, they got the stickiest fingers and brains because they want to pick up new ideas and and play with them. And I guess my challenge there is not only learning that for myself, but constantly trying to translate and constantly trying to be able to find, you know, examples that that spell it out to people who are in a different part of their their, their journey and and to make it relevant, you know, to make it outcome based, so that you're not focusing on the tech, but you are explaining what the tech could do for people. Um, to remind people, it's not about the tech. It's about the data and it's about the processes. That's a dull word for many people, processes, but it's quite important in a big organization. And, and then, as I said, right up front, it's about the people. You know, it's yeah. about people, people, people and skills. And there was a, there was a guy, I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the OODA loop, but Colonel John Boyd, who's this sort of legendary fighter ace in the, in the U.S. Air Force um, sort of career um, and, and beyond, he, he invented this, uh, this cycle, the observe, orientate, um, decide, act. But he had a phrase, it's about, it's about, um, it's about uh, ideas, people, and tech in that order. 
And of course, now with our focus on data, I say it's about it's about ideas, people, data, and technology in that order. So I guess to your point about learning, you know, I learn an awful lot about tech. I'm learning an awful lot about data. Um, I'm learning an awful lot about processes. Not it's not really my kind of thing, but I, it's it's really important at organizational level. And I'm learning an awful lot about people, but also that's where you channel the last thirty years of your life yeah. into into this. Because you know, as soldiers, we spend our time leading, following, being around people. You know, it's a it's a very people centric thing. So it's a it's a fascinating mix of what you're learning and what you bring to it. But but the day you think you've cracked it is the day you're no use to anybody. So it's a yeah. it's a steep learning curve, and I'm I'm still slipping on it. <laughs> no, amazing. I one of one of my one of my sayings that I, I said one of my sayings I can't, I can't claim it, but I write it every day in, in my diary when I start the day there's a there's a Japanese phrase called kaizen which means constant improvement constant learning and it's, it's, it's always suited me well because I, I agree I mean the world is changes so rapidly doesn't it especially at the moment and it's only speeding up you know every age is getting smaller I mean how many years ago the bronze age was thousands of age now the information age is 70 years it's just yeah. going rapidly so yeah it really is I can I guess innovate or die especially when you're Working in the kind of theatres that you are, so so it's it, it, I mean it's extraordinary, and and there's a lovely phrase actually. My daughter mentioned it to me the other day about you know don't be a know it all, be a learn it all, and 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 oh, you know that really yeah, it's really just good. a great it's a great um, it's a great phrase. But to me, to your point, so I was in Basra in 2007, the same year the iPhone was launched. Yeah, I mean that's like a blink of the eye to me. Um, but you know, can you can you imagine not having a smartphone now? I mean, yeah. it's it's just yeah. phenomenal. And you know, what's that? Fourteen years ago, in fourteen years' time, we will be looking back. You know, you will be, by then be a global communication superstar, and I'll be a <laughs> burnt out retiree or something. We'll be looking back and saying, "Hey, do you remember when we did that interview in 2021? We thought smartphones were cool. Uh, yeah, you know, amazing." We were discussing the other day. You know, we were talking about cloud earlier. Somebody was talking about hyperscale cloud and, you know, we're out to 2035 and, you know, I said, look, when did you first hear the word hyperscale cloud? You know, was it two years ago? Was it three years ago? Was it one year ago? In five years time, we won't be talking about hyperscale cloud. Yeah. There'll be something else that's hit us. You know, what does quantum mean for any and all of this? And, and when does it, you know, get operationalized? I, I don't know. Is that five years? Is that 15 years? Or is it five months away? I mean, none of us know. Uh, look at what COVID's done to, to sort of collapse our sense of change and timeframes. Yeah. So, no, it's a fascinating time. And, um, yeah, crystal yeah. balls are in short supply. So I think you've just got to learn. Yeah, no, 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 I agree. And it's, it's, it's interesting you, you talk about the iPhone. I am um, one of my favorite ever uh, like speeches when Steve Jobs did. He, he was talking about, I think they were talking, I think one of the quite techie developer guys asked about what technology we're going to use. And I think he took it back and said, you know, we we start from the customer and then we work backwards from there. You know, there's no point using this tech. It's got to be about, I guess, in, in your scenario, what's going to help the guys on the front lines do their jobs better and work backwards from that rather than being stringent to any particular you know, a cool tech or you know anything sort of too sci-fi so no, I think so i mean yes and and that's a great sales pitch of course yeah. that we're yeah. focused on i mean and and you know user focused design absolutely right i mean it's probably worth a shout out to the to the science and technology community though sure those people who are you know properly trying to navigate their way through a a technological or science-based future without any idea of, of where it's going to go. So, so for people like me, absolutely user-centric, user-focused. How do we get it in the hands of, of, of soldiers and make their lives different? But it's worth thinking through the, the challenge of yeah. those, I mean, all the same people who are helping us now get the vaccines in, into play that, that, that we were talking about earlier. But those people doing experiments, doing research, actually without necessarily a sensible set of use cases. And, and you know, just how challenging intellectually that must be. Sure. Um, uh, but without it, we never get cool tech in the hands of users. So, the, you know, we're doing a lot of work at the moment, you know, not, not least there's a wider government thing about sort of um, use of technology and the importance of R&D. 
And so I work with our, our scientists at DSTL quite a lot. Yeah. Um, the other delivery, big delivery bit of defense is in DNS. Uh, yeah. I mentioned Strategic Command, who work on multi-domain. And yeah, we, we talked about multidisciplinary teams. It's really interesting, actually. Yes, it's about user-centric design for me. Yeah. But for some of those scientists, it's about flying a kite. With some technology, you don't know where it's going to take you. Yeah. Um, and that's that's really interesting. It's a different mindset. It's not It's not a mindset I have. Yeah. But, but they've got to be part of the team because some of this stuff is going to move from sort of TRL1 to TRL9 super quick because yeah. that's how fast the world's moving. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I was, I was just thinking then, and that, I'm sure it would be an interesting question to ask. And it, you may not be able to answer it because it's just we'll probably take some thinking, but how often would you say the the new technology comes out that maybe you hadn't thought about and gives you an idea to go down as opposed to you've got an idea and you you need the technology but it hasn't caught up yet so i don't know to be honest i mean i as a as a infirmature and i i generally defer to moore's law here and just say look yeah 18 months we're we're, we're cycling around you know whatever whether it goes up to 24 or or down to a year or whatever i don't but every you know Pretty much every time I change jobs, and we do two or three years in a job in, in yeah. defense, you know, every time I change job, technology is refreshing, digital technology is refreshing. And um, so that's a that's a pretty big pace. And it's got to tell you actually about how 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 you write strategy, you know. In I I'm just I, we're refreshing Charlie Forte's digital strategy at the moment. Yeah. Um, and you know, the last one we did was about 18 months ago, and somebody was saying, well surely we're not going to do this for another five years. And I said, well, actually, I, I, I kind of think we're going to have to. Yeah. You know, well, whether it's 18 months or two years, but things are moving fast. And uh, if you're going to have a strategic approach to data, if you're going to have a strategic approach about enabling people with technology, if you're going to have a strategic approach to defending your networks, defending our bits of cyberspace, and enabling other people to fight in cyberspace or in, in space, um to operate in space uh you're gonna have to stay on your learning edge and you're you know the idea of an emergent strategy not not something that that's done and dusted become a shelfware for 10 years and in another decade you get it off get it get it out but something that's a north star guiding you guiding yeah. you roughly where you want to go but you take constant course corrections to 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 keep going the same direction despite the the changes that's where I think strategy is going in, you know, for us in, at, at this end of the, the spectrum. Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting. And, and we're coming towards the end now. So I, my last question is, is almost a bit of a, a, bit of a false question because I'm, I'm sure there's almost no end to this project. There isn't an end goal, is there? Um, but where, where, where do you see us being in, in, in 10 years? Is, is there an end goal? Is there, is there anything to shoot for? Um, I mean, we talked about constant innovation, so I'd probably say no, but what, what, what do you think? Where, where are we going? Where, where could we be, I guess? Yeah, so I mean, all, of the, all of the caveats before apply. Yeah. Um, for me, though, you know, what am I doing on Monday? That's the, that's, that's the question <laughs> for me. What am I doing on Monday? Despite all this yeah, yeah. great naval gazing, what am I doing on Monday? So for us, what I want to do, what I want to have done in 10 years? Well, we're building a digital backbone. Yeah. That is, uh, that's modern. I, that we can evergreen the technology inside it, that's secure, that we can secure data, yes, at, at cell level, but also that the users are secure on it. And, you know, not just building big walls, but assuming the bad guys are going to get inside and sure. secure, secure the data despite that. Um, and, and that it's singular, that there's a singular logic across um, that, that all the domains um, can get access to, to data. So building that backbone, um, of course, we've got many of the, the, the elements that in place, but we've got a bit of work to do to, to make it singular, to make it modern, to make it secure. Um, that is going to take, I, I guess the really hard work is going to take about three years, and then you're into constant refresh. Yeah. So I, I'm kind of hoping if we, if we make the right choices, we can, we can get the, the really back broken of that uh, in the next three years, but, but then you're still on that journey for for another decade and and forever but what we all really want to do is then having got access to the data is really getting into enterprise scale exploitation of that data those game-changing technologies that allow us to operate and fight and win for the uk and for nato and for you know our our, our friends and partners across the world and that's that's where i'd like defense digital to be 
with the rest of the events in, you know, in, in, in five or so years' time, taking access to our data, not for granted, but, but having yeah. napped that really made that uh, a sort of core of, of how we build our platforms, that we're not focused on the hardware, we're focused on how do we get data that they need to them, and then critically, how do we get the right software to those platforms, whether they be working in the, you know, on the land, in, in the air, on the sea, in cyberspace or in space. Um, how do we get the software to them, whether that software using artificial intelligence or autonomy or automation or, or something, you know, some word beginning with A that I haven't heard of yet. It doesn't really matter. But how do we get that to them with the rapidity and the efficiency that, that um, Apple or Samsung, other, other providers yeah. are available, that they do their drops onto our phones every day? You know, because that's, that's how we operate yeah. Um, that's how we, frankly, if we get it right, that's how we stop ourselves needing to fight Yeah. because we can operate at the rapidity that nobody wants to fight us. And that's, that's, that's the job for UK defense is to, you know, protect our people to, to prevent conflict. Yeah. Um, but if, you know, if it comes to it, to be ready to fight and win, um, you know, if, if, if miscalculation occurs yeah. and so that's where the journey leads us um is it done in 10 years no but but digital backbone and that that exploitation the idea of a digital foundry a federated thing across defense to really to really exploit our data and and, and get us into a software mindset rather than a hardware mindset that's um that's where i hope we are in 10 years time no amazing. let's check back in then yeah no i'll i'll, I'll put that note in your diary now no amazing thank you i said no uh we're kind of wrapping up towards the end now, but yeah, it was it was a hugely insightful conversation. I, I learned a lot, and I think yeah, yeah, for a for a knuckle dragon infantryman, some of the, some of the ideas and things you know is just incredible. So thank you for taking the time to to speak with me, and I'll uh, um, well hopefully we'll catch up soon. Great, thanks, Danny. Speak to you soon. Bye. Take care. Bye.